so when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is free. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. We are continuing in our study of the book of John as we see Jesus having an encounter, a debate with the leaders of the Jewish people around him in the temple court. And during the course of this debate, there's been an interruption, and the interruption was the woman caught in adultery. Jesus took care of this particular situation, and then he again begins to teach in the temple court. And today we come to one of the significant sections of Jesus' self-revelation. Today we have an opportunity to see Jesus' testimony about himself, about the fact that he is the light of the world. This is an important section of Scripture, especially of the book of John, because John, as we started the book of John, I pointed out that there are several key things we need to watch for in the book of John. And one was the concept of life. Zoe is the Greek word, and how life is built up throughout the book until it gets all the way to the end of the book, and the theme of life just kind of bowls you over. And it's a theme that... We don't live in as much as we should today because we don't understand it. But the other thing is light. Life and light come to us all the way from chapter 1. And today Jesus, starting with verse 12 of chapter 8, reveals himself as the light of the world to the people who are gathered around him. So I've entitled today's message, The Light Reveals himself. And now you ask yourself, reveals himself to whom? Well, at the end of the book of John, John says, these are written so that you may know him and that you may have eternal life. The the target audience is, is the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the people who are the earnest seekers, literally the ones who had already made up their minds about him were not his target audience. That's going to become real obvious today as we look through this particular section of Scripture because Jesus was really good at exposing hypocrisy. But at the same time, he was giving us a self-revelation so that we would know more about who he is. John wrote for believers, and Jesus was letting those who followed him know about the light that was in him and what it meant for us. Let's jump right into uh, verse 12. It says, When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is still during the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, it was an eight-day festival. Jesus had plenty of time to teach the different things that we have had a chance to look at, starting at the beginning of chapter 7. He has been in almost constant debate with the people who are gathered around him, who are opposing him. That was the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They were not willing to receive Jesus, and so Jesus continually is being confronted by them. He stands up in front of them, and he says, I am the light of the world. Now, one of the things that the Jewish people enjoyed was the festival of lights. And they understood the symbolism of the menorah in the temple. They understood that it was to release light to the world. And Jesus was literally saying when he said this, that is a prophecy of me. I am the one who is supposed to release light in the same way this temple was supposed to be filled with light. In the same way the light of the temple was supposed to go out to the world, I am now the replacement for that light. So in a very real way, Jesus is turning on the light, letting them know who he really is. And so Jesus says to them, I'm the light, and it drives out darkness. John chapter 1, which I've already mentioned, uh, John the apostle wrote, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The life in Jesus, that Zoe 
That life that's in Jesus. Remember what life is. Remember that chart that I've had up previously? When death came into the world, because before, before, before the fall into sin, there was no death. And so life was permeating everything. When death came into the world, it was a separation. The Lord said to Adam and Eve, if you do not give me that harvest, that day, dying you will die. Death will be released. Nadab and Abihu were a vivid reminder of that death, as were Ananias and Sapphira. The Lord said, death will be released, dying you will die. It says, if you look at your English translations, it says, surely you will die, because they're translated into something called an infinitive absolute. I like it better when you don't translate it, surely you will die, as an infinitive absolute. But you actually literally say what the Hebrew says, dying you will die. Because of the fact that that really is a description of what death became for human beings. From the point that Adam and Eve sinned, they began to age, which is the dying process. Aging, not growing up. Growing up is the life process. Maturing from being born to whatever your ultimate is in physical health and vitality. That's not aging. That's Life being released into you, into maturity. Aging is where the process doesn't stop. And now you, but you aren't going up anymore. Now you, you, you are going down. That happened because of the fall and sin. Dying, you will die. And, and death in its very essence is a separation. At the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated spiritually from God. They were spiritually dead. There was a separation between them and their God in heaven. They no longer had relationship. Their physical bodies began to die. There would be a separation of the body and the soul, and it already began through the aging process. And so there was physical death, there was spiritual death, and obviously there was the potential for eternal death, where Adam and Eve could have been separated from God for all eternity. Those are the three aspects of death. So when Jesus Christ is releasing life into the world, his life cancels those three aspects of death, because life is life to the full. It's life to every one of those areas. Most Christians are just happy with the spiritual life area, but life is to the full that Jesus releases. And that means that we need to confront this thing called physical death. We all like the eternal aspects, where life is released eternally. We like the spiritual aspects, and we like the idea of resurrection, but how about... Living in that life right now like we're living in the rest. He comes as a package, releasing light, releasing life. So, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. John was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Jesus was the light. He stood up in front of that group of people and he says, Hey, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. And that's Jesus' point. He wants his followers, his target audience, to know that when they come to him, they don't have to walk into darkness. He wanted them to have the light which brings life. Now, let's let's talk about this for a minute because there are too many areas of our lives that we're still in darkness. Jesus is the light. As the light drives out the darkness in our lives, it brings life. Ergo, any area of your life that you do not have light means that's darkness. Darkness. Any area of your existence that does not have life must have darkness. You understand? Because if he's the light that brings life, any area you have light, there's going to be life. Any area where you have darkness, that's an area where death can encroach. 
I can tell you one of the problems with our health in the world in which we still live is the darkness which is up here. The darkness meaning the light of Jesus has not overcome our minds. The battle is for the mind, and what happens is we believe so many things, and we are conditioned to believe so many things about our health, about the way things work in our health, that we end up living in darkness in that particular area, which means we give power to those areas in our life. When Jesus comes in the area of light, I mean, it says, 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be overcome is death. What does that mean? It means death's going to be overcome. Okay, death will be overcome. And of course, I know some are in here saying right now, yeah, of course, Jesus is going to overcome death. That's not what it says. It is necessary, Peter said in Acts chapter 3, that he remain in heaven until all his enemies are made a footstool underneath his feet. That's the until. Every one of his enemies is going to be a footstool underneath his feet before he returns again. If death is one of his enemies, death will be made a footstool. Ergo, just following through logically, we can understand that death must be overcome before he returns. Um, you know, Martin Luther, when he stood before the diet at Worms in Germany... He said, unless I am convinced by Scripture and clear reason. Today, most of us just say, Scripture and the traditions that I believe. I'm giving you clear reason. Our traditions are often in darkness. And Jesus confronted the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15 and says, you undermine the Scripture through your traditions. We haven't stopped. That happens all the time because our traditions are what we believe up here which prevents us from being able to have the light of Jesus Christ bring his life. But there will be a generation that's going to overcome death because it's the last enemy which is going to be overcome. Well, Jesus in, is in heaven. That last enemy is going to become a footstool underneath his feet. So why don't we start now? Just pray against every manifestation of death in your body. Yeah, I'll pray when I'm sick. No, no, look at yourself in the mirror. Do you still look like you're 25? Some of you are in delusion. I just heard one of the 21-year-olds in my head go, I don't look like I'm 25. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> Anyway, um, you understand, dying, you will die. Our aging process that we go through is a manifestation of death. I'm telling you that death, the aging process is not natural. It's a result of the fall into sin. Adam and Eve would have never aged. So you can now say, well, I'm going to wait until Jesus comes again before I begin to walk in that life. Or you can say you know what, I'm not waiting till then. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I am going to pray every day that death gets its hands off of my body. From the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing and forceful men take hold of it. It's your choice. Are you going to be a forceful man or woman? Are you going to grab the kingdom of God with both hands? Let the light of Jesus Christ flush the darkness out of your minds? What's the worst thing that can happen? You look younger. <laughs> you develop persistence in prayer. You stand before the Lord and the Lord looks at you and says, you did good. You didn't get there, but you did good. You were driving darkness out of your mind in so many different areas. You know, 
It's the Hebrew 11 thing. There's not everything we go after we're not going to attain. They didn't in Hebrews 11. The heroes of faith they're called, and they didn't attain everything that they had faith for. But hey, they were forceful men and women who were forcing their way into the kingdom of God, attempting to go after the things that God had promised, and they didn't always get there, but God calls them a hero. You know what we think? Well, that's just foolishness. If I pray for something and it doesn't come in, that's foolishness. That's darkness in our head that makes us think that. Is it foolishness to pray for someone with terminal cancer that the doctors have said have absolutely no chance? And the answer is, in the world's eyes, yes. Not in God's eyes. The sacrifice of praying for someone who is dying is a incense that is pleasing to God because of the faith which it is definitely presenting. I'm just driving the, I'm using the flashlight right now. I'm just driving out some darkness in our heads because we need to get this darkness out of our heads if we're ever going to have a generation that is able to stand up and overcome death so that Jesus Christ can come again because every one of his enemies is going to be made a footstool under his feet. We might as well target the big one right now. And you say, well, you know, there's a lot of other ones too. Of course there is. But right now we're in the book of John. And light and life are important. Okay. We need to get that darkness out of our head in every area. It's, it's, it's the picture, even morally, you know, in, in John chapter 3, he said, you know, those who are being, who God is working in, they aren't afraid to come into the light and say, I'm just not that much. I struggle with the same things that James struggled with. I struggle with the things that are common to humanity. I mean, that's just us. We're human beings. And God, with his spirit, will help us to become something that is far different than what we were. But if you're in reality, you know it's God. Now, I'm far different than I was 25, 30 years ago, 10 years ago. I'm far different than I was five years ago. And every step of the way, I know it's God's spirit changing me, molding me, shaping me. Because I know what's in me. I know what I could become without God's grace, his mercy, and his help. See, but that's, I'm, I'm not afraid to step into the light and say there's really nothing good that lives in me that is in my sinful nature. What I am is a demonstration and a manifestation of the power of God in my life changing me from glory to glory. That's, what we have, that's how we live. And when we come into the light, what it does is it gives hope to others so they'll come into the light. It's only in those areas of darkness that we end up being overcome. You know, oh, I can't tell them about that because that would make them hate me. That's just a lie. People come to me and they confess some of the most, you know, into, not just me, but our leadership. They come to the leadership and they say, you know, the, the most horrific things in their soul. They're like, oh, this is, this is the most horrid thing. They're going to reject me if I tell them. And finally, the Holy Spirit gets through to them and they say, okay, I'm going to share it with someone because I need help. And what happens is the person they're sharing with goes, yeah. Welcome to humanity. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no facades here. We're either captives of sin in some area of our life or we've been freed from captivity of sin. It's one or the other. We're in the process of being freed and have areas of freedom in our life that the Holy Spirit has given us as the light has come into our life or we are captive in bondage to sin in areas of our life. That's the way it is for a human beings. And we get that reality through our heads that will help us so that we step into the light uh, at a, a far more quickly. Oh, have you ever had this thought? Boy, if I only would have said, admitted something sooner, I would have had help sooner. That's the way it works in the kingdom of God. Anything we bring into the light loses its power. It's one of the reasons that the 12-step program works even for non-believers. Because the 12-step program is they come into a meeting and they say, I have this problem. They take the problem out of the darkness and they put it into the light. And why are so many people successful in the 12-step program, even if they're not Christians? It's because they've brought it into the light. And now they have help. It loses its power. Anything you bring into the light loses its power. Okay, we have a lot of verses. I better keep moving. Okay. 
Jesus says, I'm the light of life, all that good stuff. The Pharisees challenged him, because they didn't like this, by the way. They knew exactly what he was saying when he said he's the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing on your, as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. This is interesting because the Pharisees are appealing to the law. You know, uh, except on the testimony of two or three witnesses. You understand that? You need two witnesses. And uh, Jesus was well aware of that. In fact, Jesus in John chapter 5, he said, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not valid. Jesus was saying that to them. In that context, in John chapter 5, he was saying, you know, you're right. If I testify about myself according to the law, if I'm appealing to the law, what's going to happen is I have an invalid testimony. Okay? So here, Jesus is testifying about himself, and he is doing it in a fashion to appeal to his believers, to the believers, to the disciples, to those who are around him. His focus group is a little bit different. He appeals to the reality of who he is, and his focus group is for his disciples. He's not appealing to the law. He is showing who he is to those who can receive it. He's not having a debate with the Pharisees. As you read this section of Scripture, be aware, there's only one side having a debate. Jesus isn't. See, the Pharisees had already made up their mind. There's a man by the name of Jonathan Haidt. If you've read any of... I've read some of the stuff that he has done because Joshua had to do a paper on the guy. And uh, I, I, he's been on TED Talks. He's, he's uh, got books out. He's been on the news media and stuff like that. His perspective is simply this. We are wicked to the core. Now, he doesn't call it wickedness. He just calls it human nature. But when you read his perspectives on humanity, he's not a Christian. Oh, not by any stretch of the imagination. But when he studies humanity, when they've studied brain patterns and stuff like this, this is what they found out. When they're studying brains, right when a debate starts, the responses in the brain demonstrate that a person intuitively jumps to their preferred answer. And the rest of what they do is finding evidence for what they've already decided. That's humanity. That's why sometimes when people start a debate with you. It's why debates are fruitless. Stay away from Facebook debates. They're not only fruitless, they're stupid. <laughs> uh, when, they're, when you get into a debate with someone on Facebook and there's two people, there are two fools working together. You're not, it, nothing's going to happen. No opinions are going to be changed. It'll just, it just, you know how it goes. It's just going to get, it's going to go down and down and down and down because people are going to get more incensed. When you can't come up with a good reason to back up your belief, you usually do all sorts of uh, violations of um, logic and debate and everything, and you begin with arguments ad hominem. You're ugly. <laughs> You're stupid. Now, if we could only stay at that level, that's not where it stops, okay? I mean, the whole groups of people are brought in as, you know, negative slanders and stuff. Um, but what happens is this is the, the way of debate. The Pharisees, Jesus wasn't debating them for the simple reason. They had already made up their minds. So they were in the process. They had jumped to their preferred answer, and now they were, all, they were just looking for reasons to attack Jesus, and Jesus is literally ignoring them. The only things that he is doing is the responses he's giving are for those who can actually hear. By the way, we get to the end of this section today, and we're going to find out in verse 30, and we're not, that's not for today, but you're going to find out that a whole bunch of people that were around put their faith in him. And you know how important the word in is in the book of John. It means they became true believers. They put their faith in him as a result of this discourse between him and the Pharisees. Jesus did not have the Pharisees as his target audience. 
He, they say, hey, you, you're, you're testifying for yourself. Jesus says, I can testify for myself. I, I, I know who I am. He says, I, <laughs> I know where I came from and where I'm going. And that doesn't sound like much of an argument to us, honestly, but he knew his source, he knew he was from the Father, and he knew where he was going, back to the Father. That's all he needed. He, you know, if, if you know that, I know where, <laughs> where I've come from and where I'm going. I already mentioned this, John chapter 13, Jesus, earlier today. Jesus, this is in John chapter 13, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Do you know the freedom that he had? He knew that the Father had given him all power. He knew that he had come from God. He knew where he'd come from. He knew where he was going. And as a result, he was able to wash the disciples' feet. He was able to do anything that the Father told him to do because of the fact that he knew where he was come from and he knew where he was going. You know the freedom that we can have if we step into that type of life? Well, he knew his source and his destination. Jesus said to them, You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right. Because I am not alone. He's just pushing buttons. You imagine. You're judging by human standards, but I'm right. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Okay. Jesus, that's helpful. Now, by the way, it gets worse when you actually look at what it says in the Greek language. It doesn't say you judge by human nature's nature. It says you judge by the flesh. Theologically, flesh is a bad, bad term. And so Jesus is saying to them publicly in their temple where they teach every day, he's saying, you guys are so filled with the flesh. You're so filled with wickedness. In their place, that's their spot. That'd be like going into one of the higher schools of learning, the halls of exalted education, and standing up and looking at the professor and saying, you're just an idiot. See how that would work for you, by the way. You judge by fleshy standards. I pass judgment on no one. I don't judge people the way that you do. I don't judge, criticize, carp, go after. That's what they're doing. You just criticize and you carp after everything. You're fleshy and critical. That's not how I do it. When I judge, the source is the Father. If I judge, my decisions are right because the Father's with me. If I'm doing any judging, it's because the Father is showing me what I am supposed to do and how I am supposed to do it. And then he says, and by the way, there's two witnesses. You're appealing to the law. Let me tell you, there are two witnesses. And uh, (laughs) this one you have to think about. Where were they? Well, they were in Jerusalem. Where did John the Baptist baptize? Right outside of Jerusalem. The people came to him in the wilderness by the Jordan River. I mean, not right outside, but you know... Like all of Jerusalem came. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came. So what happened when Jesus got baptized? Matthew 3. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. I want to ask you a question. Do you think in that day and age without television that this wasn't the topic of conversation? for months and years afterwards by the tens of thousands of people that would have witnessed it, including the Pharisees and the Sadducees? You know, I was standing by the river the other day and, you know, the heavens opened up and there's this guy standing in the river and the father up there is a voice that came from heaven. This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. You don't think that that was the topic of every every table talk during that whole time period? Jesus is saying, by the way, you're saying I'm only one witness. You're forgetting one. He must have torqued them off. (laughs) They asked him, where is your father? This was either frustration coming out or accusation. They, they, because, you know, it's, it could be later on they're going to basically say, we know who our father is, basically, because that that old lie against Jesus about the fact that he was born of a fornication relationship with Mary because it was a virgin birth, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so this may have been that type of attack, impugning his heritage, or it could have literally been just frustration. (laughs) I have two witnesses, and they're like, where is he? They 
by this point, probably were pretty upset to the point where they could just cry out in frustration. Jesus said, you don't know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put, yet no one seized him because the time had not yet come. As frustrated as they were, they already had sent their guards to arrest him. The guards had already come back right before that last episode with the woman caught in adultery. The guards had come back and said, no one ever taught like this man. He was, they were supposed to bring him back to them. He, they were supposed to arrest him, seize him, bind him, and bring them. And they said, where is he? And they said, we can't arrest this man, and he, he's back. And he's still in the temple court. And they're still not arresting him. Well... When they ask where your father is, he says, you don't have a clue who my father is. He just, you don't know. Remember what Philip asked him? It says in uh, John chapter 14, Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Philip, after all this time, Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? See, Jesus is the image of the Godhead in bodily form. If we see and study Jesus, we're seeing and studying the nature of the Father in heaven in his perfection. Because Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. If you want to find out what the Father thinks, listen to Jesus. Because he communicates the heart of the Father. They are that close. So the revelation of the Father is in Jesus to us. He's the one that we can see. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only has made him known. The Father is, has been made known to us. And then we got this thing where Jesus is teaching in the temple. By the way, where the offerings were put was in the court of the women. So it means Jesus was teaching in all the places he could have taught. He taught in the court of the women so that there would be access. See, he could have taught just to the men, the court a little further in, less crowded, no crying kids, you know, that sort of thing. But no, he, he taught in the court of the women so that all of his disciples could be there. Everyone was be able to hear exactly what he had to say. And it says no one seized him because his time had not yet come. That phrase, his time had not yet come, Jesus could boldly show up in the temple because his time had not yet come. I hope we can get a revelation of that. When we walk in the power and protection of our Lord, we are invulnerable. Now, I mean, remember, Jesus didn't have any area of darkness in him, so be aware of that. But when we walk in the power and the protection of the Lord, and he puts us on an assignment, and we are walking in his light and in his purpose, we, we're, no matter where we are, we're as safe as if we are in our own bed. Remember Stonewall Jackson believe that? Remember Stonewall Jackson, one of the greatest generals that fought for the Confederacy? A, a, a Christian, a man of God, and uh, he, he would get out on the battlefield, and he'd rally his men in the midst of bolts flying everywhere, and they'd say, how can you have such amazing courage? He'd say, because I, I'm as safe on the battlefield as I am in bed. Because he believed that there was a call and a destiny for him. He believed that there was a time appointed to him where he would go to be with the Lord. Stonewall Jackson, amazing man of God, he was finally shot by one of his own men by accident in the fog, and that was probably the Lord's mercy to him and to the United States, because the war would have gone on a lot longer if he'd have been alive, because he was such a great general. And so the Lord was having mercy on the north and the south, because the bloodshed had already been, it would have been far worse if he'd have stayed alive. And uh, the Lord's plan was for the United States to stay together, and for all of the blessing and benefit to come from it, from the freeing of the slaves and all of that. That was obviously the Lord's plan. And so he ended up checking out. But he was right. He was as safe in the, on the battlefield as he was in bed until it was time for the Lord to take him home. So now, once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where, where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? Once more, 
You know, the NIV drops a word here. There's, there's actually a word before once more. And the word that is before once more is the word therefore. Isn't it interesting? Therefore. You know why the NIV drops it? Because it's not obvious why it's there. Now, the word therefore, whenever you see the word therefore, you always ask yourself, what's it there for? Okay? It's like a funnel. The word therefore is a funnel. You know, it's, it's like, I've just said some things, and now it's going to funnel down to a point. And so when John is writing this, he is saying, therefore, based upon what Jesus just said, based upon what I have just written, since his time had not yet come, he decides to push them even further. Do you think it would have been fun debating Jesus? This is where he's at. He's going, yeah, and they can't get me, so I can say this next thing. He is driving them up a wall. That's how Jesus responds to religion, by the way. When you are in a religious thing, and what I mean by religious things, where it's, all, it's not about relationship with the Lord, it's not about growing in relationship with him and each other, and our dead statutes become something that's far more important. What dead statutes? Well, not his will, of course, but I'm talking about the stuff that we make into dead statutes. We've got all sorts of dead statutes that we grow up in. in my, when I was growing up, we couldn't dance. A lot of people still have dead statutes. They think you shouldn't dance in church. That's as dead a statute as you can get. It can't really be from the Lord because you can't dance. I mean, God wouldn't dance in what? Have you read the Old Testament? Have you read the descriptions of worship in the Old Testament? Have you read God's purpose and heart for his worshiping people? That's a dead statute. There's nowhere that it says that in the Bible. You know where it says that? Our reserve culture and tradition has said that dance is something that we don't do in assemblies. If you're at a football game, that's okay. You can jump up and dance around all over the place. That's dancing, by the way. It's not very formal dancing, but it's dancing. People do it at football games all the time, but God forbid you do that in church. Why? Because it's one of my dead statutes, and you better not violate it. We have dead statutes everywhere. Our traditions that undercut the life of God. I could go on, but I don't want to be that offensive today. Jesus didn't care, though. He was... Therefore, since he knew he could be more offensive, he decided to be more offensive. welcome to Jesus. If you've never seen Jesus like this way before, he is just, I mean, you have. If you've read Matthew chapter 23, you've seen Jesus at his push him to the limit finest. He's standing in the midst of their teaching grounds, calling them blind guides, and how will you escape from being condemned to hell? That's pushing things. He just did it. Say, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. He's t- <laughs> You're going to die in your sin. You know what that means? He ain't going to heaven. That's what he's telling them. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, and this, remember the Jews is code in the book of John for the religious leaders who had made up their mind ahead of time about him. Will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? Well, Jesus, of course, when he said, I'm I'm going away, he's talking about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension. And uh, what he's saying is, by the way, I'm going to be going away, and you're going to be looking for me. Why would they be looking for me? Why would they be looking for him? Where did that body go? The disciples are saying, you don't think they were looking everywhere? The disciples are saying that he rose from the dead. We need to find this body. They were looking for him. See, he was crucified, but then he rose again from the dead. He wasn't in the grave anymore. There was no body to find. Then he ascended into heaven. They could never find that body. They've tried. So they're asking this question. They don't understand any of that, and so they come to their fleshy conclusions. Is he talking about killing himself? And it's like, where did you get that from? Where I go, you cannot come. And they're saying, well, that must mean he's thinking of killing himself. That, you know what they're doing? They're projecting. They wanted to kill him. 
He ignored their thing. He said, he continued, you are from below. That's not a compliment. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. These are the guys that would pray, I thank you, I'm not like other men, like this tax collector over here. Remember, that's who he's talking to, just so you're aware of the context. I told you that you would die in your sins. He repeats it. If you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. So he just keeps pushing. You are from below. He's comparing their sources. He says, you know, you're being influenced by the other guy. I'm being influenced by God. He compares their sources. He compares their identity. He says, I'm not of this world. He said, you are. Okay, you're, you're, you're buried in the world. Remember Jesus said about his disciples, you're supposed to be in the world but not of the world. You can be in the world, working in the world, but you aren't supposed to have the world's opinions and the world's way of looking at things. That's a challenge. It gets the darkness out of our head when we start to do that. And then their destinations, right? You're going to die in your sins. I'm... I'm going to be with the Father. You're going to go to hell. And then there's something here that, you know, you you might see it in the English here a little bit. See the brackets around the one I claim to be? Jesus is doing something that's just pushing them a little bit like this, okay? And you say, why? Because what he's using is the Greek expression, ego eimi, and and that's all he's saying. And there's two ways to interpret that particular Greek expression. And it is by saying, if you do not believe that I am. Or it can also be interpreted, the one I claim to be, or him, or whatever. There's, 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 it's just, what he's doing is he's doing something they can't quite pin him down. He's just pushing him a little bit. By the way, by the time we get to verse 58, he's not going to do this push. He's just going to lay it out and let him know what he's really saying. However, at that point, the debate is over because they try to kill him. And so he's not letting them know. He's not saying the thing here because if he says it in a way that's unambiguous, he knows that the conversation is over. If you look at verse 58, if you have your Bibles, you'll see just how over it was. They were going to stone him. These guys are, he's pushing them. They finally say, who are you? Why were they asking that? Well, they were attempting to get him to self-incriminate. I mean, they, they wanted, they were trying to get him to say something that they could get him for. This whole thing was about trapping him. Who are you? Come on, say it. You've just said ego a me, and you left it nebulous. We're trying to get you to claim to be God or the Son of God because we're going to get you then. And Jesus smiles and looks at him and says, haven't you been paying attention? <laughs> Just what I've been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I mean, that really, I mean, seriously, they're trying to get him to say it. And he says, well, just what I've been saying, which is kind of, they were, at that point in time, they were, ah! I have much to say in judgment of you, but... He who sent me is reliable, and what I've heard from him, I tell the world. He's just, you know, you guys haven't been paying attention. I've told you who I am, and I'm just telling you what the Father has said about you, and it isn't good. The Father, you know, it isn't good. They did not understand that he was telling them about his Father. So Jesus said, when you had lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. Notice the brackets again. He does exactly the same thing again. He does that little push. He says, when you've lifted me up, you're going to know that I am. And that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what he pleases. See, here's that play on the words again. Jesus says, I am. The Greek is ego eimi, as I've already said. Those of you that know anything about the Greek language, you can see what it looks like in the Greek text. However... 
This is the one where Jesus gets down to in John 8, 58, and he says, before Abraham was, I am. He makes it explicit. There's no way. The context makes it impossible in John chapter 8, verse 58 to translate it any other way than before Abraham was, I am. That's a present active indicative of the Greek verb. I am. The amy. Ego just means I. It's an emphasis, I And Jesus here once again looks at them and they didn't really understand he was talking about the Father when he was talking about the one who sent me, so he made it real explicit. He says, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And he left it just, the phrasing, just nebulous enough that, that they couldn't, it was like, okay, the context may mean that he's saying that I'm the one that I claim to be. said, but you're going to know that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. He just does this thing, and it's infuriating them. They're after him. They're saying, what are you going to do? Eventually, he's going to lay it right out there so there's no question mark about it. But like I said, the conversation's over at that point, and he's got a lot more to say between now and then, so he's not going to make it that explicit because he doesn't want to make it that explicit. But I'm telling you what he's saying. He's saying to them, you're messing with things you don't understand. And he says this amazing thing. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know. What's he telling them? He's giving them a prophecy. He's saying, after the crucifixion, you're going to know that I am. You ever get those uh, guys knocking at your door who don't believe in the deity of Christ? Okay. I, they go through our neighborhood periodically. Sometimes they skip our house. <laughs> Which really isn't, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't debate with them much anymore because I just told you about debate and it's the whole thing about debate and all of that. But, but um, I used to have a lot of fun with them because when they would come to the door, it, it, it was, I remember the first time I did this, we were living in an apartment complex in Coral Springs. It was 1987 and they came to the door in the apartment complex. <clears throat> and I remember the first time they came and I said, you know, I... I said, the problem I got is you say that Jesus isn't God, and he clearly claims to be God. They said, no, he doesn't. I said, yes, he does. If you look at John 8, 58, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. That's the ref reference to the tetragrammaton, Yahweh, when God says, I am that I am. Tell him I am has sent you. It's a reference in saying, I'm the God of the universe. And they said, well, let me check. And they open up their Bible, and it says, before Abraham was, I have been. And I looked at that, and I went... I mean, honestly, it's the first time I heard this. And I went, oh, your Bible translation is a lying Bible translation. You have wicked leaders who have misinterpreted it on purpose to lead you astray because it's a present active indicative Greek verb and there's no way to translate it that way. Now, you can imagine these poor people. Uh, how do you even answer that? I just looked at them and said, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's impossible. It's a lie. The, Greeks, the Greek phrase is ego a me. That's a lie. And they kind of went, oh, yeah, okay. Let's leave this psychotic, psychotic man's house. I got better at this over the years because now, I mean, because I, the horror of what I, I knew was happening, I mean, honestly, their leaders are wicked, okay? I can say that right into the camera. Their leaders are, leaders are wicked for translating something which cannot be translated that way. They're purposely leading their people astray, trying to deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's wrong. It can't be done. I learned after that 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 didn't have a really good result when they back out of the door and went, ah, okay, their hair blown back, you know. And uh, so in years to come, what I would do is I would I'd still go to the same scripture passage, but I would be in a very reasoned term, begin to talk to them about the interpretation of the, I'd show them the Greek Bible and I'd explain to them that this is a, well, this is the reading that is there and how the only can be in translated I am. And there were many times where they fled down the street. Because, you know, normally there's a trainee and a trainer. The trainer is there is to grab people when they're losing the debate. The trainer is to get the young person out of there or the newer person out of there when they start losing the debate. And I've seen them run. 
I remember once, I think it was 1995, my dad had just bought a motorhome used and I was working on it for him outside the house and I had just turned on the refrigerator which ran by gas and suddenly they came up to the door and I started having this debate and I mean they were engaging in it and uh, they were losing big time, okay? I mean it was one where the young person was going, you know, and really it was wonderful and all of a sudden the older guy says, something's on fire. And I turn around and look and the motorhome, the, the refrigerator is on fire. And I'm thinking, Satan. <laughs> I had him. I said, be right back. Went and grabbed the fire extinguisher, put the fire out, turned off the gas, came back out, and they were down the road. <laughs> anyway, Jesus is saying to these people, here's what's going to happen to the religious leaders. He says, when you have lifted me up, you're going to know I go, Amy. That's a prophecy. I think it's a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. It's still hanging out there. The one who identified himself as Yahweh, so closely identified to the Father that if you've seen one, you've seen the other, made a prophecy. And the prophecy is that after you have lifted me up, you will know. Wow. You want to see a prophetic word by the Lord Jesus? There's a time coming when they will know. Implication? Receive. Pretty powerful. We know other scriptures say that. Paul said it very clearly. He says, you'll know what? You'll know my relationship with the Father. You'll know who I really am. Ah, isn't this great fun? Like I said already, when Jesus got done saying all this, a whole group of the ones that were there, the target audience, believed in him. We'll talk more about that next week. But I hope today, one of the things that I just, I'm just hoping to do is to show you a little bit more about Jesus. He self-identified as the light of the world. He self-identified as he and the Father are one. He self-identified saying to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is not just some good prophetic guy. Jesus isn't just some great prophet or some wonderful person or lesser deity. He calls himself, I am. There's no way around that. And when our religious traditions get in the way of I am, I am is on a bulldozer mission and rolls right over those religious traditions. So today, just very simply, all we need to do is take the light of his word and shine it around in our lives, whether it's we've believed too much about the power of death over ourselves after Jesus rose again from the dead. We haven't yet allowed that reason to start to... to you know, wait a minute. The Bible starts talking about these things. We haven't allowed the light of God's word to inform our reason so that we begin to think in terms other than our traditions and our way of understanding the world in which we live. We need to get biblical eyes. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, you know, you've got to be born again. You've got to be reparented. You have to grow up again in the kingdom, parented by a different set of parents so that you begin to see how this world really works. Because obviously we all grow up in households that are human. And in the kingdom we need to be, we need to grow up in the kingdom household so we see how things really work. There's a destiny and a calling on everybody that's here today. And the key to unlock it is to ask the light of the world to get rid of all the darkness in your life. That's a prayer he's going to answer. And it may not be comfortable. But hey, when's the last time that you really cared more about comfort than Jesus anyway? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to see who you really are once again. For the way that you would not give in to those with religious mindsets when darkness was their true motivation. Lord, I thank you that you are the light of the world and that that light shreds the darkness. I ask now, Lord, we give you permission. We give you permission to shine your light into every area of our life so that we are able to walk away from the false constructs, 
Well, we're asking for mercy. We're not asking that this be done publicly. <laughs> but we are asking that it be done so that every area that needs to change changes. Help us step into your light, Jesus. Amen. Amen.